Hey y'all, uh, welcome back. Uh, now we're starting a new unit. So we're in imperialism and in World War II. So we're progressing along the American timeline. We've just finished the Gilded Age, Progressive Era and Reconstruction. We just took that test. Hopefully you feel good about it. And so, but also hopefully you're getting in the habit of watching these notes and taking notes and knowing that this is the source of the information that I include in our assessments. So thanks for watching and, and continue to take notes. and as we go through. And again, I'm trying to be as quick as possible and just highlight some of the main facts. So even today's lecture, I'll skip over some things uh, to try to uh, quicken the pace than if we were here in the classroom, but hope you're doing well. Hopefully uh, your family's well and we're getting ready for the Thanksgiving th season to be thankful uh, for what we have and where we live and just the fact that we're going through this presidential election peacefully, peacefully, so. But anyway, so today we are talking about imperialism. It's a fancy word, maybe you've never heard of it before. I'll talk here on the definition on the next slide, but it's basically how America is gonna expand its influence beyond its borders. So we're gonna go all the way from the East Coast, if you remember the original 13 colonies, then we're gonna add Vermont and Kentucky, Tennessee, and continue to spread Ohio. We spread West, we call that manifest destiny, right? Where it was the American belief at that time that we're gonna spread West and stretch America from coast to coast, that manifest destiny that we are kind of destined by our creator, by God to spread. And, and any obstacle we encounter along the way is, is gonna be short-lived compared to sort of the longit longitivity of America being a strong country. So what do we do once we come coast to coast, though? And that's this time period in the late 1800s, early 1900s that we call imperialism, where we have opportunities to spread our American ideals, our power, and kind of conquer and control other groups of people outside of the lower 48 states um, of the United States. And so here's Uncle Sam in this cartoon. It's like he's at a restaurant sizing up what he could be eating as far as territory. Here's the Cuba steak, the Puerto Rico pig, the Filipino plantation islands, and the Sandwich Islands, also called Hawaii. So, and he says, well, I hardly know which to take first. What is it gonna be? Well, actually, Uncle Sam's gonna be hungry. He's gonna take all of them in this time period. So, and then what's his dessert? I don't know, Guam, uh, you know, we'll, we could get into that too, but. Uncle Sam is hungry in this time period. So what is imperialism? It's the economic or political control of one peoples over another. And you'll see this as one of your test questions. I'll put this on your assessment, but imperialism is the economic or political control of one people over another. So either you're in spreading your ideals and power to control uh, economies, to control businesses, to control raw materials, That's, those are all economics, or for political control to spread your democracy or spread your power and influence around the world, create an empire. It's kind of how we've seen it in world history. It might look like something on this map where the European powers are uh, going through Africa and dividing sections of Africa up, parts of Asia up, so you see here's Great Britain, they have the British grab bag. Here's the German, German grab bag. And then uh, I can't really read this is the Frenchman, I believe, or the Mongolian, uh, oh, Russian, Russian also. So they're engaging in empire building, right? And really spreading their ideals as, of their country for economic or political gain. We're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna have this foray. So we've seen three forms of imperialism in the past in world history. We've seen the colonial, uh, system in which there's colonies set up that exist to profit the mother country, usually raw materials like in the American colonies shipped to Great Britain. Uh, we also have protectorates where there are weaker nations controlled by a stronger nation and protected by that stronger nation. Just as we have Puerto Rico as a territory now and Guam, these are really small islands, small areas that would be too uh, such a drain on resources to have their own military or their own Navy. So we've kind of taken them over and said, we'll protect them. Uh, we also do it to kind of larger nations like Japan after World War II, we said, well, well, we'll be your offensive military. If anyone ever attacks you, we'll come to your aid as long as you stay our friends. And so we have a protectorate that way too. Then lastly, there's what's called a sphere of influence 
where foreign countries come into a place and exert economic or political control without really taking it over, without influencing too much, but they're just trying to pull out kind of resources or optimal trade. Uh, we call that a sphere of influence. Okay, so we've seen all these forms. America is going to largely engage in this protectorate uh, type. And so some of the nations we protect uh, become territories or some that we protect become states like Alaska and Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii, you know, continues to have about five to 10% of the native Hawaiian population toys with this idea of having independence. Uh, but if they did, who was going to come in and then sweep them up because they won't have a navy or a military. So it's just an example uh, of a protectorate, which America kind of likes as a form of imperialism. So we have old imperialism uh, used to be nations would go in and take what they want and don't change the people who cares about the natives. Uh, but as we turn the century, when America gets involved, we have this overarching sort of sense of duty to the people that we take over. And so we call that new imperialism, where you go in, you still take what you want, but you try to change the people and improve their lives uh, and improve and like civilize them basically. And that's this cartoon uh, popularized by a running Kipling poem called The White Man's Burden in which white nations, Anglo-Saxon nations like Europe, America, Canada, uh, Australia had kind of have this obligation uh, to go and, and to conquer more areas but then to civilize. So they're taking native groups and educating them or Christianizing them or uh, giving them capitalism, right? And kind of just going step up step over hindrance and over vice and oppression and trying to uh, improve those native societies. Okay, this is called the white man's burden. We now know it's racist, right? No one wants to do this anymore uh, because you're going in, taking what you want and changing the people. So now we just enter into agreements, right? Trade agreements or political agreements with countries instead of just whole scale, taking them over and taking what we want uh, and then trying to civilize uh, groups of people. But this was the mindset around this time. Okay, we're doing a service uh, to the country and the peoples we're taking over because we are gonna civilize them uh, and help give them the tools that have made us successful. Uh, in white Anglo-Saxon uh, countries, so Western civilization. So what are the reasons for imperialism? There's four. One's industrialization. So as we are in the Gilded Age, we're going to continue to need these raw materials to make stuff with. So, you know, it's not that America sort of exhausts its raw materials, but we want to continue to look for things that we don't have here. Oh, pineapples? Yeah, let's go to Hawaii. Sugar? Let's go to Hawaii. Or we can go to the Caribbean and get those resources there. Oh, Alaska, there's all this gold up there. There's all this timber and lumber and coal. Yeah, let's go up there and take this stuff. So we did not find it a lot in the lower 48 states. So let's expand uh, into the tropics or in, into uh, the ice regions where Alaska's at and, and harness those materials. Um, so, and then we get to also open up these areas that we have control over to sell our manufactured goods that we make there in their markets and make allow our American businesses to make more money. So there's this industrialization that's happening, which encourages imperialism. Number two, we see the close of the American frontier. Again, we've gone from coast to coast. So by 1890, we've entire the, occupied the entire continent. We need somewhere new to expand to, to expand our influence and to also continue to take sources and resources from. Number three, we want to follow the European example. These European countries, especially Great Britain, especially France, Germany, have expanded, uh, you know, throughout the world. And so created these large empires of which uh, the strongest in this time period is the British Empire. And so we want to kind of compete at their level and say we've arrived too as a great and powerful nation. Uh, so we want to take our rightful place there by doing kind of what they're doing. Number four is American nationalism. We have sort of this belief that America is strong, that America is great. We have the kind of the best systems in the world. So we wanna take our rightful place amongst the most powerful nations. And uh, so we're just proud to be an American and we wanna spread those ideals, especially democracy, especially our capitalistic economic system 
uh, throughout the world. And so expansion was seen as a natural continuance of this manifest destiny of Lady, Lady Liberty spreading across the West as we're going through the uh, plains and then to the West Coast and taking with her democracy, taking with her technology and uh, this great ideals of liberty and taking them around the world as well, not just stopping at the West Coast, okay? So the Monroe Doctrine is going to uh, continue to sort of frame how we are involved in the world. So even though it was made in 1823, uh, we are going to tell European countries to stay out of the Western Hemisphere of North America, South America, stay out. You guys deal with what's going on in the Eastern Hemisphere. That's your area, sphere of influence, Africa, Asia. Okay, fine. Do your thing over there. This is ours. So we're going to start to exert more authority uh, in, in North America, South America, the Caribbean, uh, and islands in the West and the Pacific, uh, because we are going to establish this Monroe Doctrine. Okay, it was meant to keep European powers out of the Western Hemisphere. And even though it was said in 1823, this is the conclusion of the War of 1812, in which we kind of defeat Great Britain, kind of we do, kind of we don't. But essentially after that, we're like, all right, you know, stop having an influence on us. And successive presidents that are after continue to keep saying this, hey, this isn't your hemisphere, so stay back. And so with that stay back statement, we are also kind of uh, exerting influence over the Western hemisphere that we are in at the same time. Skip over that. So by the time we get to World War I, for instance, and war breaks out in 1914, Europe's on fire, Africa's on fire. So the world is at war. You can see it, the W-A-R. We have kind of built this wall where Uncle Sam is looking over this wall and he's like, huh, sucks for you guys, this is your problem. This is the Eastern hemisphere problem. Us in the Western Hemisphere, uh, North America, South America, this isn't our problem. Have fun burning up. And eventually we are going to get involved in that war. Uh, so it's a complete world war and not just a great war as it started, but it becomes a world war. And we're going to fall into that uh, as well. We'll get to talking about that. But the one war I do want to talk about is a great sort of symbolic war that represents this imperialism time period. It's called the Spanish-American War. You can kind of get a sense of the two countries involved, Spain and America. And so we're going to have, uh, we briefly talked about Teddy Roosevelt, but we're going to have a real uh, war hero that catapults Teddy Roosevelt into the vice presidency and then eventually the presidency. But it's going to be this war, the Spanish-American War, that really catapults uh, Teddy Roosevelt into the national spotlight that gains him prominence and uh, catapults him into the presidency. And so he's basically going to drop what he's doing at the time, which is he's a, a representative in the state house in New York. He'd be like, okay, I'm just going to go make a regiment of uh, cavalrymen and go down and fight in Cuba against the Spanish. And he does that in his group of men is called the Rough Riders. They all have horses and they're riding rough on these horses <laughs> and they end up sort of vanquishing the Spanish out of uh, San Juan, uh, which is around Havana, the capital city. And uh, uh, some pretty cool accounts of him in war fighting this battle. And so he comes back to America a hero and then catapults his political career and political star even higher. But why do we get involved uh, as a whole country in the Spanish-American War? Well, we had a humanitarian sort of cause. To be a humanitarian means you care about human beings. You don't want them to suffer. You want to treat them well. And so we had this humanitarian argument for why we wanted to go to Cuba which was under control of Spain at the time, a Spanish colony, because we heard that the Cubans were not being treated well. So we became sympathetic to the Cubans who wanted independence. We thought democracy would treat them well uh, because we love our democracy here. And we heard that the Spanish general was putting uh, Cuban civilians in concentration camps for no reason, just, uh, just uh, oh, you're an enemy of the state here, go to this concentration camp. So we had a humanitarian reason for fighting this war, for feeling like we we're going to improve the lives of Cuban citizens to get rid of the Spanish. We also had an economic interest because they're so close. They're only 90 miles off the coast of Florida, for instance. So like U.S. businessmen are trading in Cuba about $100 million a year, uh, which is a tremendous amount of revenue. There's tobacco, sugar plantations there, and we're going to have a huge stake in, in those plantations economically. So we want to continue to see uh, our economics and businesses thrive. It's going to push us into war. And also we had yellow journalism. 
Uh, some of our industrialists at the time, we had two, you had a chance to research. This is William Randolph Hearst on the left. He had a newspaper out of San Francisco and LA. And then this is Joseph Pulitzer who had a uh, newspaper out of New York. They were continuing competing against each other. Well, what? They're like looking for any subject to talk about and kind of sensationalize the news. So you have a shred of truth and then you like build into this narrative or this story that makes it incredible, like a can't put down story. Like you're reading the paper, and you're like, oh, what is going on in Cuba? Oh, so, and it's Hearst that here on the left that originally said, you give me the picture and I'll give you the story. Okay, just saying, come on, give me a picture and I'm gonna kind of make up the details or the facts to sensationalize the news. This is like the original fake news. You probably know the term fake news, you've heard it, especially in our, uh, political politics in the last four years. So the original fake news is this yellow journalism. And so the ultimate goal is to get people to buy your newspapers, right? And to give you money, which is why both these individuals uh, are gonna be pretty wealthy. The wealthiest is William Randolph Hearst. Um, but what they're gonna do is talk about how awful Spain is. Spain becomes the scapegoat. Let's go and mash up the Spanish. They're hurting everyone in Cuba. They're hurting the Cubans. So it's going to raise U.S. hatred of the Spanish because they're sensationalizing these news stories, these little bits of truth that they're hearing to try to get people to buy their newspapers. And then lastly, because of this sensationalized news, we're wanting to see, hey, is the Spanish actually mistreating the Cubans? So we send a United States battleship down uh, off of Havana Harbor, off of Cuba, and it's just docked there. It's kind of just you know, checking things out. It's just sitting there. And then mysteriously in the middle of the night, it explodes and 260 Americans die just out of the blue. And so if you had this huge battleship that just explodes out of nowhere, you would think it must be the work of the Spanish. Those darn Spaniards, there's traitors. They're so treacherous. They wouldn't even declare war on us. They would just blow up our battleship that's there. And so as Congress returns to session, they have a special session, what should we do? Well, the battle cry becomes for both Democrats and Republicans, remember the Maine to H-E double hockey sticks with Spain. Let's go to war. And so there is a declaration of war. Uh, and this is the wreckage of the USS Maine. So these are pictures posted in like the newspapers, either uh, Pulitzer, Hearst, or other nationwide newspapers. So you're seeing this, you're like, how did this happen? How could an American battleship just be utterly destroyed like this? And so here's the New York Journal. This is Pulitzer's paper. And so he has this picture. Naval officers think the Maine was destroyed by a Spanish mine, which you see kind of hanging down and under the water here. So is the Spanish, they did this bunch of traitors. So in a reward offer, $50,000 for the detection of the perpetrator of the main outrage. And Assistant Secretary Roosevelt, this is Teddy Roosevelt, convinced the explosion of the warship was not an accident. And so we are sort of getting the catalyst that is going to catalyze the American people and the Congress to shove us into war with Spain, is this mysterious sinking of the ship. Historians have since gone back and tried to figure out what happened. The best conclusion that they have is that there was a sort of an ammunition gunpowder room at the begin at the front of the ship and it just spontaneously combusted. Like literally that's the best kind of uh, thing. We know it's not a mine because the Spanish didn't mine the harbor because they would have been mining their own ships coming in and out of the harbor. Uh, but the best we have is that the gunpowder aboard the ship just spontaneously combusted because we don't have any other evidence since it's been uh, over 100 years, and, and uh, so, yeah, that's the best conclusion that historians could have come up with. So, but here's newspapers kind of printing, sensationalizing stuff that they're seeing or reports. So a senator went to Cuba, and here's what he reported, just emaciated young people that are malnourished. It must be the Spanish. They're so bad. Here's a Cuban mother crying over her dying child, and here's the sailors. Here's the Spanish brute. Here's a Spaniard. What is he doing? He's standing on the grave of Maine sailors who were murdered by Spain, and he has a bloody knife. So again, mobilizing Americans to be against the Spanish and to go to war. So what ends up resulting is, yes, Congress does give a declaration of war, which lasts from May to July 1898. Why such a brief period of time? Only three months. Not even that, really, less than three months. Why is it a splendid little war? It's because we 
like were a huge victor uh, in this war. The United States Navy destroys the Spanish fleet that we encounter in the Philippines. It used to be the Spanish Armada. It's diminished in this time, but utterly we just destroy it with our really strong battleships that I don't have a chance to get into during this time. But we also capture Cuba. So we kick out the Spanish there with Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders. We capture Puerto Rico and the Philippines as well. And then the Battle of the San Juan Hill, this is where Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders really destroy the Spanish military that's in Cuba. And uh, so we're able to really occupy all these territories that used to be Spanish territories and possessions. And uh, kind of an interesting fact, more Americans actually die of tropical diseases than they do from enemy fire, specifically from the Spanish. And malaria was the major killer, uh, people not knowing necessarily how to treat it yet. Um, and we didn't, you know, really have a lot of good drugs to combat it like we do now. And so, but here's a picture of the Battle of Manila. This is the American battleships in, off the coast of the Philippines utterly destroying the Spanish Armada. You see they're blowing up, ships are sinking. Looks like the American battleships are just like, you know, untouched, which is pretty true what happens. So how does this war end? It ends with what's called the Treaty of Paris. There's multiple treaties of Paris because the French love their freedom or they love, just love hosting conventions to talk peace, which is what the case is. So we've had multiple treaties of Paris. You need to just look at the year to understand which conflict is being ended. Like the Revolutionary War ended with the Treaty of Paris, for instance. So then here's another one. Then the Vietnam War is gonna end with the Treaty of Paris. Those are just some examples, but under the Treaty of Paris of 1898, so Cuba is gonna be free from Spanish control. Yeah. And we get to give them democracy and continue our business there. Uh, Puerto Rico and Guam are going to be given to the U.S. as possessions. And Puerto Rico, still to this day, a territory that wants to be a state. Uh, and then Guam is another territory. Uh, they're too small to really be a state. They don't have enough uh, citizens to really apply for statehood. But Puerto Rico could. But Congress has since kind of rejected them, although there's been calls uh, by the Democrats this year to try to uh, allow Puerto Rico in as a state uh, so they could and what is the motivation well it would help the electoral college it would give at least three electoral votes uh, to a liberal uh, state which is concerning to Republicans but it's an ongoing conversation will we see that if Biden uh, you know gets into his presidency and and wants to do that we'll see and then the Philippines were purchased for 20 million dollars uh, but they didn't go willingly. They weren't happy to kick off the Spanish only to have the Americans come in and colonize them, imperialize them now too. So they're gonna fight uh, some many wars against America and American forces that eventually uh, were like, okay, you know, you have your own self-government. So basically from the early 1900s until World War II, we're just like, okay, you do your own thing. Then the Philippines get taken over by the Japanese. And then after World War II, we grant the Philippines their independence from us and from Japan. So kind of an interesting story, but all of these, you see all these uh, pink areas, these all become territories we take from the Spanish, including the US Virgin Islands, you see Puerto Rico, um, and over here, you see Wake Island, there's Guam in the green. So we add all these little Spanish possessions, okay? And probably the, one of the interesting things that we'll continue to talk about when we get to the Cold War is what's called the Platt Amendment. So yeah, Cuba's free. Yeah, create your own constitution. Yeah, democracy is great. Oh, you're gonna use capitalism as your system for your economic system. Great, that's awesome. Okay, by the way, we are gonna force you to add this amendment to your constitution. So what does this say called the Platt Amendment? Well, we would only remove our troops from Cuba if you add this amendment, and what does it grant to America? Well, it gives the United States the right to intervene in Cuba whenever necessary to protect life, liberty, and property for Americans. And it also grants us a permanent naval base called Guantanamo Bay, which we still hold to this day. So uh, when George W. Bush was president, it was the site we were taking terrorists from 9-11 from Afghanistan and Iraq and interrogating them there and holding them. We still have 9-11 terrorists hold up on Guantanamo Bay right now because we don't give them constitutional protections because it's not technically American soil. It's technically Cuban soil that they granted to us and they never took back. So it's still uh, ours. Uh, president Obama committed when he was president that he was going to close it. 
Um, but he there went from 500 inmates down to 100 during his presidency. And so he let a lot of terrorists go and he became under fire for that. So he ended up leaving a little more than 100 in there to try to uh, and didn't end up closing it down. And so it's still a permanent naval base. We still have many terrorists. Uh, that we captured that are there. Uh, they're just kind of just there the rest of their life unless a president comes and releases them. So, because they're enemies and terrorists, they're not given constitutional protections under the constitution because they're trying to kill and destroy America and Americans. So, okay, but this is where we'll stop. When we continue next time, we'll talk about how Teddy Roosevelt goes from zero basically to a hero after helping to be the major victor and winner in uh, the Battle of San Juan, which catapults him into the national spotlight. He becomes a vice president and eventually president. We'll talk about that next time, but I'll stop here after my 25 minute little lecture. So this is part one of two. So there'll be another lecture on imperialism and then we'll be done. We'll move on to World War I. Uh, after this in, in, little imperialism subunit that we're in. So thanks for taking notes. Uh, let me know if you have questions.